you have purpose in life, then you have a direction and you can you can focus your energies towards specific goals. I mean, you, you need direction. It's sort of like if when NASA shoots a rocket towards the moon, they have a direction, like they know where they're going. And there are lots of course corrections along the way. And then at the same time, they learn from their mistakes in the past, but they don't dwell on them. And then you make the most of the moment. You know, you and I already got into a great conversation. Sometimes this happens. You know, we we almost have a podcast before the podcast. And <laughs> we were talking a little bit about um, life and the acronym that we use, love, impact, faith, and energy on this show all the time. And uh, you started to tell me that it's really the reason that you wrote this book. Like it was one of the things that you saw that that you wanted to dive a little deeper into. And so you know, let's start. I'm going to go backwards after you answer this question. We'll we'll get a little input into your history, and we definitely have to visit the four time whistling champion international. Um, but tell me a little bit about what drove you to write this this newest release. You know, I spent a lot of time thinking about the gifts from God, and I think we have a duty to use those gifts to the to the best that we can, and. When I was growing up, my father said, do your best. He said, don't try to be better than that kid over there or don't keep up with the Joneses. Just take advantage of all the gifts you've been given and do your best. So I, th so this book is about how to be successful, however you define it, how to be your, your best of what your God-given gifts enable you to do. So I, I've done mentoring for 25 years with college students helping them think through their careers, helping them find purpose. And I accumulated a whole bunch of lessons from all these interesting and powerful bigwigs that I've worked for, literally four billionaires, the chairman of, of uh, federal agencies and uh, you know, presidents of universities. I mean, it's just amazing the people I've, I've been able to work for. And I'd say, oh, let me tell you about uh, what David Rubenstein would do in this situation. Or let me talk about how Arthur Levitt, who was the chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, where I was a spokesman there, uh, how he would build bridges with people who think differently from him. So I accumulated a, a whole bunch of these lessons and I love to write. So I said, well, let me gather them all up and put them in kind of anecdote form. And they're stories. There are 50 stories all about how to be your best. And uh, and it really, it's about finding purpose because if you find, if you have purpose in life, then you have a direction and you can, you can focus your energies towards specific goals. So this will be a tool for me uh, with my mentoring. You know, I've kind of codified all these great lessons and I'll be able to slap them down on the table with a 22 year old. And I'll say, look me in the eye like this. I say, if you read this book, it will change your life. And I met some guy just recently who said, I don't believe you. And I said, well, I'm going to send you the book. You're going to read it and we're going to talk about it. And I guarantee you it will change your life. It's such a great way to live because I, 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 I feel like the bigger the goals get, the bigger the game gets, the bigger the business gets, whatever it is, uh, the more granular each day matters. And what I mean by that is purposefully because you can constantly be digging towards a new goal or a big objective or whatever it may be. And when you're talking to billionaires, people that have multitudes of businesses, not just one, they have unbelievable power. And if they're using it for the right things, you know, if they really break it down to that, that, that impact they're making each day, they can close their eyes at each night and actually feel good about themselves. And and I think that's a really big challenge for a lot of business people is they they live too far in the future or too far in the past and and they get lost in in the peaceful presence that exists in the journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's such a good point because I mean you you need direction and and you it's sort of like if when NASA shoots a rocket towards the moon, I mean they have a direction like they know where they're going. And there are lots of course corrections along the way. And then at the same time, they learn from their mistakes in the past, but they don't dwell on them. And then you make the most of the moment. I mean, I, I have this uh, personal letterhead and on it, it says, it's the journey, not the destination. 
because while you you have to have goals because that gives you purpose each day is a gift each moment is an opportunity to and you know is to love your your neighbor and we can we must never forget that and you know i i spend a lot of time when i mentor young people say uh telling them try to spend more time thinking about other people than just yourself and the amount of goodwill you will put out into the world it will come right back to you and with goodwill also and it will help you appreciate and and i've actually coined a phrase which is don't deny the world your wonderment and you know young people will say oh well, well, why would anyone care what i have to say or what i think and i say you know people will care because you have gifts and if you put the time in to develop them and bring them to fruition then don't deny the world the gifts that god has given you it's because it is not an accident but especially the, the development of those gifts has to be purposeful and then you're able to kind of spread out into the world you know my kids are, have always been fascinated how i talk to strangers and i say because you never know what's going to happen i mean i have the great stories of people i've met through the years because i try to treat them with respect i love them as fellow humans and the the people i've met the things i've done the opportunities i've had are just knock my socks off um uh, so it it's it's really a cool way of thinking i think well i i love it because i believe that life gives to the giver and takes from the taker it's a saying i hear a lot from joe polish who's someone i love to to follow he has a great podcast but um when you give to the world, you have to give a little bit of yourself in a connection. And I think this is the thing that young people struggle with. You know, you're really trying to find yourself. So you don't think to your point that people care. And so my son, my sons, my two sons will say, dad, you tell people too much. And I'm like, no, no, I'm giving them enough of myself. So they know that I'm safe. So they know that they can talk to me. You know, I, I, uh, I was uh, in the story like this, Chris, I was uh, on a trip to New York. My son was scrimmaging the New York Red Bulls in their facility uh, in New Jersey. And uh, we were staying in the W down in um, uh, in Hoboken so we could go into the city, see the city. My oldest son had never seen the city. And um, I had a car lined up. I had everything lined up and everything fell through the morning mm -hmm. of the scrimmages. And I was 45 minutes away. I call an Uber. I get a driver. The driver played professional soccer in Poland. Him oh and my I, gosh, that's him, wild. It's awesome. He 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 uh he was hovering around the hotel because the Red Bulls were playing um uh, Lionel Messi and Inter Miami. And so Messi was in our hotel. And so we Whoa. had all these good things that were happening, right? So so we get in the car and I just start talking to the driver. I sit in the front seat, I don't sit in the back. The driver shares with me his story. He moved to America in 1994 to play professional soccer. It was pre-MLS. And to make a really long story short. This guy and I end up bonding all the way out, and he ends up um, driving me throughout the entire day. We have tickets to the game. I had an extra ticket, so I offered him the ticket. He didn't charge me all day for the driving, picked us up, took us to the game, and now I've been in New York two more times, and he has driven us everywhere, and we've become wow. friends. And it's the story that you just mentioned where – I gave of myself. I told him why I was there. I told him how important it was. I thanked him for being there for me. I was so grateful at him just being in the universe because it saved me at a time where I needed it. I wanted him to know it. And that gave him enough safety to open up about his career, about his life. And um, I love that you're teaching young people these things because that to me is something that they have to open up. They have to develop. They have to be willing to put themselves out there to receive the good that's out there to be given to them. I just love that story. And that, that is just so true. And I, I think that if you, you know, if your listeners are saying, well, how do I do that? And I think it's a, it, it, it's first having a bias towards goodness that you should kind of give the people around you the benefit of the doubt. And you don't know this Uber driver, but why not give him the benefit of the doubt until he proves otherwise? And like, so for example, um, a friend of mine said, hey, uh, I, I have a friend, so it's his two people removed, who works in the White House and he's looking for a job. Can you help him? 
and I'm, I'm really busy. I'm promoting my book and I've got a lot going on with my consulting business. And I said, but I never say no to helping a friend's friend. So I met with this guy several times. I've made connections for him. And then out of the blue, he calls me up and says, hey, would you like a tour of the West Wing of the White House? And I said, well, I can't go. I'm out of town. But my wife and daughter want to go. So this guy took them on a tour of the West Wing. They got to look into the Oval Office. The president wasn't there, of course. But and, you know, it's because I I helped him. I didn't expect anything in return. But he then reciprocated. And now we're friends. And uh, I'm going to make more connections for him. He's a smart guy. He's a nice guy. And uh, so I think if you go in and you phrased it well, if you're willing to just give and don't worry about getting stuff back, it, it, it'll come back to you. So there's, so there's kind of a, a trust there. And, and there, there's also joy. There's joy in discovery. Like I, th- this is a wild one. So I met this guy recently who just, I, I pulled into a parking lot. And he pulls up behind me and says, hey, I see your bumper sticker. And it says High Point University. And I said, yeah. And I said, my son goes there. And he said, hey, my son just graduated from there. I said, hey, that's cool. And then he said, hey, I see you have another bumper sticker that says uh, Got Springbox. And now, and I said, oh, yeah, Springbok is a miniature African antelope. And he said, I know, I'm a Springbok. And I'm like, oh, that's really weird. And, and, and I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, I'm South African. And I swam on the national swimming team. And since an, a springbok is the national animal of South Africa, you're called a springbok. And I said, well, that's really cool. And I said, hey, uh, I'm going to my uh, daughter's softball game. Do you want to come? And he said, oh, I'm not going to the game. I saw you on the highway and I followed you here. I'm like, oh, my gosh, that's freaky. And then I said, what do you do? And he said, this is totally wild. He said, I am a lung transplant surgeon at the major hospital in Fairfax, Virginia. And I said, that is the coolest thing ever. Let's have lunch. So he and I then had lunch. And I then I gave him my new book and we've kept in touch. I don't know what's going to happen. I have no idea. But this guy is smart. He's fun. He's interesting. If I need a lung transplant, he's my first call. Yeah. <laughs> so it's it's like serendipity it's love, it's openness. I mean, of course you have to exercise judgment, but like you just don't know where it's going to go. And those, that spirit and those connections can have material impact in your life. Yeah. It's, it's a great point. I, um, I, I was just listening to Arthur Brooks and Tim Ferriss's podcast. So on the way up in between my work phone calls, my son was napping. We left super early to come on the five hour drive out to the college. And um, and I'm listening to Arthur Brooks and and Tim Ferriss. And Tim Ferriss is kind of a he's a great interviewer, um, but he's always got this cloud around him. And and it's and he's he's he shares it. Like he he shares his challenges and he's open about it. And Arthur Brooks has a very clear mission. And and um and I love the research he's doing, I love the books he's putting out, I love a lot of the things. And I feel that correlation to the connection that people are missing in life. You know, the, the the more we can do this, we can have Zoom meetings like this and we can build and have conversations of having never met each other. But, you know, I will I will give this book away. I will share this with the 22 year old. I, I will absolutely utilize the tools that you have created to better someone else's life in a simple one time meeting. But sometimes the connections are so quick and and not deep enough that we don't give our, ourselves a chance for the connection. And what you do and what you just described was you went in with noble intent. You 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 don't assume the guy's super crazy. You you have a guard up in 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 some like if someone follows you up the interstate, you have to have a little bit of a guard up. But at the same time, you're just open to life coming at you. And you know what? Because you mentioned God a couple of times, it's also having a little bit of faith in understanding that there's a lot of things out of your control. And if we love this life and we've identified that we're living it the best way that we possibly can, and when our life is gone, we've identified that it was a good life. It's a heck of a way to go in open-minded. It's a heck of a way to open Mm -hmm. up to those serendipitous moments. Yeah, I I think that's really well put. And I'm a huge believer in serendipity. 
And, you know, it's to a great extent, life is like a pinball machine. Like once you hit the ball, you don't know where the ball is going to go, but you have to be open to opportunity. You know, there's, there's actually a, an interesting lesson in the, in the book about it's called hang around the hoop and hanging around the hoop is a physical stance and it's a psychological uh, kind of approach. And uh, the, the way it, it takes pl- place in there in the book is about, so I worked at the Carlisle group, which is a global private equity firm manages almost $400 billion. You know, they buy things, they make them better and they sell them. And I did the PR there for 18 years. And uh, one of the founders, a guy named Bill Conway, he loved and he embraced this concept of hanging around the hoop because it's all about being ready for opportunity because you don't know where it's going to come from. And in this particular instance, it's just an amazing uh, thing that happened is that Carlisle bid on a, a deal. It was like a billion dollar deal and someone else bid on it too, but the other company won. So, and they Carl was pretty upset because they thought they, uh, they, they thought they should have won now. So, but Bill calls up the seller and says, I respect your decision. I'm unhappy about your decision. And it was, it was fair. And I look forward to doing business with you again someday. Then like two months go by, the seller calls Bill up and says that deal fell through because it couldn't get regulatory approval from the government. Are you still interested? And Bill said, yeah, I'm still interested. And I'm not going to pay you as much as I was before. And they still did the deal. And so when I talked to Bill about that, I said, walk me through the mindset. And he said, hanging around the hoop is not being bitter if you don't get what you want. It is saying life is not fair. I'm going to, I'm going to try to do my best and I'm not going to burn bridges. And then it's sort of like, you know, the people in the NBA who get rebounds, you know, they, their hands are out. Their eyes are all twitchy. They are ready. They're looking around. And it's the same thing with life is that if someone, if you don't get what you want and you stamp your feet and slam the door, you know, you're not going to get the rebound. And so much of life is about hitting roadblocks. And then, it, then how you react to it. Do you just, you know, take your marbles and go home? Or do you figure out a way to go over, under, around? the roadblock or not. And then, so it's that attitude, that physical stance, that mental ap- approach that is so central to seizing opportunity. That's, that's great. Yeah. I was, I was envisioning the whole time you were talking about standing underneath the basket, boxing out, opening up my stance, having my hands up, like you described, and then yeah. even fight being willing to fight for a rebound, you know, being willing to actually go in and, and, and take what you want or get what you need. And you have to be willing to actually put in the work that it takes a lot. The best rebounders, the hardest workers in the NBA, their, their, their work yeah. ethic is impeccable and, and they have to be because they have to be very resilient. They get beat up underneath the rim. It's not the easiest place to be. Um, but I, I love that's exactly that. it. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. And, you know, it, life is a contact sport and, you know, th- there are some themes in the book. Gratitude is one of the themes. Resilience is a theme and uh, being grateful for gifts is a theme, but also not, um, not being entitled. I, I have like an anti entitlement mentality is that no one owes me anything. You know, my parents gave me life. They gave me a good start. But, you know, the chips don't always fall where you want them to, but you just got to keep motoring on and then having that, that, that spirit of, you know, of joy and excitement for what is to come. Yeah, it's, it's really, really great. You have, in your experience and in your career, you've had such a wide scope of opportunity. I mean, working with the Carlisle Group, um, you, you've done something that we were talking about prior uh, on the, on the, uh, the, the, the pre podcast recording button going, going live. And, uh, I'm really interested in it because it sounds like your son is, is attending uh, high point university and you are, um, you found a way to give to the university in a way while your son is there, which I, I love because as you have big things that happen in your life, if you can kind of 
you know, in, in, encompass all those things in some capacity together, the things you love with the things you do with the reason you do it. That's really what I heard as you were saying, and I'd love you just to talk a little bit about it as, as something that is really interesting because I think people that buy the book, understanding the human behind the, the book is what makes people really value the words in it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm glad you brought this up, Scott, because, you know, so much of life is like having a dream or a vision for something and then just trying to figure out how do I make that happen? And this experience and this role that I have at High Point is a really good example of that. So, so my son is a freshman uh, and he's enjoying the school and we, you know, we, we tour the school, he gets in, we go to family weekend and I see these big posters and I saw the stuff on their website and the emails from the school of these experts in residence. And they have an actor in residence, a guy named Dean Kane, who played Superman. Yeah. And they have Steve Wozniak, the co-founder of Apple, is one of these experts. And um, they have Mark Randolph, uh, who was, Net I think, Netflix? Netflix, I think. Um, I mean, all these bigwigs. But even though they had a school of communications at High Point, they didn't have a communications expert. So I say... Wow, that's kind of weird. That should be me. <laughs> and I, so then I say, all right, how do you make that happen? How do, like, what's the right way to go about that? So it turns out that I have a friend who is also one of those experts in residence, and he is the global business leader in residence, and he's the former ambassador to the European Union. Uh, he's a former senior government official. He's the chairman of AT and T. I mean, we're talking rarefied people here. And so I call him up and I say, Bill, I said. I think I'm perfect for this job. What do you think? And he said, I agree. And he connected me with them. We talked about it, figured out what they want, what I want, and we sealed the deal. So now I go there uh, at least once a semester. I spend two days, three days there. I do lecturing, uh, mentoring. I, I, I give my books uh, to the young people as just, just for free. I say, listen, this will change your life. Read the book. And so then I get to hang out with my son at night. Uh, which is great. And then, you know, some, some kids are a little embarrassed about their parents, but thankfully my son thinks it's kind of cool that I'm affiliated with the school. So, I mean, there's so many lessons here about uh, like just being observant and saying, huh, there's a gap here. And then uh, having confidence to say, well, maybe I could be that person. And then trying to figure out how to make it happen. And then like pouring myself into it. You know, I love working with young people and, you know, they're, they're green. They don't know a lot. And, but, I, you know, I'm 60 years old and I got a lot of stuff in my brain and I try to like open my brain and pour it into their brain. And I find that to be very fulfilling. And uh, so you're right. I'm able to combine a whole bunch of things here and I'm hoping I could do it for years to come because it keeps me young and I learn a lot from the young people. I'm learning a lot about social media and other uh, ways of doing PR that the, the professors are uh, they're kind of on the cusp, like new new ways of doing it. So that helps me in my job as well. Well, and and ultimately, um, you know, I've referenced this quite often. I love the uh, the phrase and that I love the term uh, eulogy virtues. I love to to talk about the things that are going to matter when you're no longer here, because a life with with no hard feelings, with no regrets, with love out pouring and and the things that we really want right are the most important things and fatherhood is really really important and it's something that um you know unfortunately not enough not an, not everybody gets to experience in the way that that you're describing it today and um and I try to give my children the same thing there's another benefit that you're that you're that I see that you're doing right now and that is our children hear it and they they listen and and they they uh, really engulf a lot of what we're teaching, but there's also a, a line of what they can truly uh, understand uh, to some degree. It's very difficult to listen to exactly what your father's saying and do exactly what he's saying when you become a young man or a young woman. But when you're teaching his peers, when you have the ability to be a mentor, when he watches you not only say it, but do it, there's really a special thing there that's, that's, that's really, to me, it's about the action. It's about, it's the very reason, 
you know, if you broke down my life, I would say that God is number one. I would say that my family is number two. And I would say my impact is number three. And that's my career and whatever impact I can make on the world. But my family is when I when I'm when I'm gone, I want them to remember that I love them and that I gave them everything that I could provide for them and all of myself, even the bad parts, the good parts, the bad parts, the challenging parts. But I think that's what's really cool about what you're doing and what you're talking about is some people are so afraid to to mess up the apple cart there or imbalance life in some capacity. But you went head first. And that that's why your son enjoys having having dinner with you and hanging out with yeah. you. You know, I think the phrase you use about going head first is really, really important. And so I have uh, some friends who are very smart and pretty accomplished who are just unhappy in their jobs. And they kind of like either hit a ceiling or things turned at the job. And and I'd say, find a new job. And they say, oh, I'm too old now and I'm going to – you know, I've got tenure. One of them is a professor and I don't want to give that up. And I'll say, life is too short. Be strategic, have a plan, but don't settle. I don't care if you're 50 years old or 55 years old. I started my consulting business at 55. David Rubenstein, who's the founder of Carlisle, is a billionaire. He, he said for years and years, if you don't start a business by 35, you won't. And I always thought, I don't, I don't see why that has to be. So I literally, I turned 55. I leave Carlisle and now David is my main client. And so there's this notion of like life is short. You don't know if you're going to get sick or run over by a car. You know, I don't live my life worrying, but I'm mindful that life is short. And settling is not a good thing generally. Because remember what we're talking about, how do you be your best and how do you be successful? Again, however you define it. So I have, I have a friend who, one of those friends finally left his job and found a new one. And he said is the best job of his life. And he is now probably 58 years old. I'm so happy for him. So proud of him that he had the courage to finally do it. And it worked. I mean, there's no guarantee, of course, but if you just, if you just settle, you know, it's almost, remember we talk about the physical stance with hang around the hoop. The opposite is settling. We just kind of slump over and you're mopey and droopy. And it's sort of like Eeyore from, you know, Winnie the Pooh. Yeah. He's just, you know, I mean, this for your listeners, if, if you, you have gifts, don't deny the world your wonderment, find those gifts, refine them, share them put them out into the world. I mean, it's life is short. You know, when I meet a 22 year old and I say, Hey, what are you interested in doing in life? And some of them are excited and like have an idea. Others are, oh, I don't know. I don't know. And I say, like I shake them and I say, your life is 25% over. And they're like, Oh my gosh, I never thought about that. I'm like, yeah, you need to think about that because life is short and you got to get going. And so that's why doing this survey of what your skills are and being thoughtful about how to employ them in the world can really give you purpose and get you out of bed. Like there's, there's a lesson. I just love this lesson. It's probably, there are two of the most important lessons in the book are about gratitude, which I, I know you will be excited about, um, and happiness. So the gratitude lesson is, is, is it's an amazing lesson. So here's, here's a billionaire. Uh, who's one of my bosses at Carlisle. And he's do this is 20 years ago. He's doing an interview with a, 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 new, a news reporter and he's just telling his life story. He grew up with a single mom. Uh, he worked in the family business. Like it was just a, like a five and dime type shop. He goes to Syracuse University, goes to Harvard Business School, serves in the Navy, goes to Marriott Corp um, as an executive and then forms the Carlisle Group and 20 years later, he's a billionaire. And this guy is the epitome of gratitude. So he says to the reporter, I am so blessed and grateful for what I have that I levitate out of bed to seize the day. And he, I only heard him use this phrase once, levitate out of bed to seize the day. And I was so blown away by it because it gets at the heart 
of seizing your gifts and your opportunities and not frittering them away and, and watching them go by because they will listen, life marches on and you're either going to, it's either going to pass you or you're going to keep up with it or not. Well, how we go at the day has a lot to say about how we live our life. And so if we lay around in bed every weekend or every weekday or whatever it is, and we wait to get up and we're slow and we're not excited and energetic, that is not only probably a bad way to start productivity, but it's also a really challenging way to get motivated and, and to build on a better day. I don't mind an occasional uh, nap. I don't, I don't mind an occasional, um, you know, sleeping past the normal time, but at the same time, I do like to get up and be active right away. And I found that so much of, of um, I found personally, just individually, that I don't like to wait to do the things that I find so important to the end of the day. So working out, uh, spiritual time, you know, any time of, of prayer and meditation, um, I do my cold plunges and my sauna in the morning. Like I get it all done. I feel like I've already been productive by the time most people are starting their day. And that allows me to have this feeling of, of excitement to go at the day because I've given myself time. At the end of the night, I'm less likely to want to stay up later because I haven't had time in my day yet, you know? And um, yeah. I think teaching young people that is such a powerful shift, but it does take a while to get there. It took me a long time to get there. I love that. I, I think, you know, like self-care is important and your faith and your body, uh, kind of mental health and all that. So I totally get it. And I think that's, and it's also... Um, like the concept of inertia, it's it's a fascinating physical concept because, you know, it's an object in motion will stay in motion, but an object at rest will stay at rest. So if if any of your listeners are thinking, well, you know, where do I find the purpose? Like to some extent, taking just taking a step pushes you into a motion stance. You are now moving and if you are moving, the odds are you're going to continue moving. And then as you go through self-discovery about what are your gifts and talents and passions and dreams and all that, and that will help give you purpose. And then that motion will, it will, it will drive you towards achieving those objectives. And, you know, none of it's easy, you know, and especially if, if life is cushy, you know, uh, David Rubenstein has long said, he doesn't know, many um, Nobel Prize winners who were the children of wealthy people because they didn't have to strive. I mean, I grew up in a, like a regular middle-class suburban family in Long Island, New York. And, you know, we'd go on one, one week vacation a year. We didn't go to private school. We went to public school. We didn't go to the country club. We had a park in front of the house. And those things were, were good for me. Uh, I do worry, you know, we're, we're, I'm much more financially successful than my parents were. So I do worry that my children won't strive as hard. Now, we always tried to build into them, you know, having an allowance that they had to earn and pushing them to be their best in school and to stay focused and avoid stupid things like social media and the like. But I, and I see good signs from them that they are striving because I think my wife and I, impressed upon them the importance of uh, not denying the world their wonderment and harnessing their gifts and the like. Yeah, I, I, I really love the way you put that. And I think, I think it's one of those things where we have to move towards the basket to receive the rebound. So we can't get in the stance if we're not moving towards the basket. So the, the yeah. analogy there is it keeps on with the, the, the being under the rim and really being in the stance because it does provide you the opportunities. And then the other part to that is, is um, in talking, we, we covered a lot there, the, the gratitude um, and the way that, that somebody goes at the day and that inertia is also really important, but it does just start with one small thing. Sometimes it could be a small, one of my uh, good friends, um, he, he told me to meditate and he, for years, he's like, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta, you should try meditation. And, and I've always prayed and meditation in a lot of ways to me, prayer and meditation are, are very similar. And the more I meditated, the more I realized this, and it's just a, a, a present state. Right. But um, I had to, he said, just start doing one minute a day. And I started with one minute a day 
And then uh, it was five minutes a day. And then I saw him at, a, at an event we were at and I said, I can't, five minutes a day isn't enough. Now I'm doing five minutes a day. Like every time I have a transitional moment in my day, like I take wow. one to five minutes where sometimes when you pull in the driveway, right. And, and it's been an intense day and, and some days are just more intense than others. And I pull in the garage and I just stop. I turn the car off and I just take at least a minute to breathe through that, you know, just because, and that's, that's a 45 year old version of mistakes made in the prior 20 years where I would go in so intense and so excited and and so excitable. And, you know, you bring that same intensity home and, and that's not, that's not really the, the, the thing that I should be doing. And so learning to transition, um, I pray or meditate sometimes when I'm just walking up the stairs to the office or walking out. And I, I say that only because what you're describing is something that I, not only are you teaching it, but it's something that I've executed upon and appreciate it being out there more and more because I believe it's the small things that we do that really make such a difference. And mm-hmm. I think Chris, you're you're making you've made a life of that. I mean, I read I read some uh, different articles. I read some stuff you put out there. I watched uh, your TEDx. I, I you know I do a little bit of studying, and you bit you walk through your life whistling. So <laughs> I, I, this is how you transition uh, to a really cool topic. And, and, but you, you really have had a demeanor of positivity and maybe whistling through your life and really loving that connection to music and having this, this drive, but, but putting it out into the world. It's a perfect example of what you did. You whistled out loud. Somebody said that you should, you should really do something with this. <laughs> you enter into a contest that you didn't know existed and you win four times you're an international champion at whistling. Walk the listeners through just a little bit of that story and some of the people that you've met because of it, because I think that's a really interesting thing as a part of, of the story. Yeah, so I, I learned how to whistle when I was five years old. Thankfully, I'm actually able to whistle. And my father whistled all day around the house, so I was exposed to it. And the ability of being able to make music happen rather than just think about it really inspires me to whistle. Anyhow, so I I have a paper route, and I deliver uh, the newspaper for four years, and I whistle two hours every day while delivering the paper. So I got pretty good. Then I go to college. I whistle at talent shows. I, I graduate from college. I come to Washington. I start whistling at blues clubs at open mic nights and people are kind of freaked out by it. They're like, what's your instrument? And I say, I'm a whistler. And they're like, a wrestler? I'm like, no, a whistler. Like, and they're like, that's kind of weird. And But then I'd whistle and they're like, that's cool. Um, so then I, I compete in the international competition and and I, I win a small prize the first time. I go back the next year and I win the, the whole thing a grand international grand champion. And then I, I win it three more times over like an eight or nine year period. And it like radically changed my life. And like the people I've met, I've whistled in the Oval Office for the president of the United States. I've whistled with symphony orchestras. I have a, a, a big concert coming up with the Alexandria Symphony uh, in, uh, in a holiday concert in December. Um, and then I've, I've done this thing. It's kind of a ministry where I whistle happy birthday for people. So I whistle happy birthday 650 times a year. And uh, it is like some people might think, oh, my gosh, that's like a total like it's complex. It's a burden. And it's a, the highlight of my day. And like, like today, you know, I'm just looking at my calendar here. Uh, I have I have two birthdays today. And these are friends of mine from years, years back. And I'm going to call them up. I'm going to whistle happy birthday and honor their life. And it makes them happy. It makes me happy. And so, you know, I, I wrote a book about it. I've done TED Talks. I have a CD. And, you know, whistling is a, a whimsical. It's joyful. A, a lot of people can do it. And I've just developed it more than most people. And then I try to share it with people. So it's, it's been a, an amazing part of my life. Uh, so I'm really, really blessed to have it. Yeah, I mean, I, I every time I I open a book, I like to see, you know, uh, not only what's in between the uh, the the cover and the back, but also who you had write uh, an excerpt or a or a, a quick, um, you know, a, a 
what do they call them? Uh, uh, blurbs. A blurb. Blurbs. Yeah, I forgot the blurb. I, I forgot. <laughs> I think I zoned it out. It was actually stressful for me when I was trying to do the book. I remember going, oh, I got to get blurbs and I have to matter. Oh, yeah. And and um, but it was really cool. I saw Paul Ryan. Um, I saw um, Governor Yunkin in in your book as well, which I think is is pretty cool. He's he's done a unique thing in Virginia where he actually brought maybe the political parties together after a very, very broken time. And, and uh, you, you, you have a lot of uh, political in that beltway region, you've had a lot of political influence and you've met a lot of really interesting people who I think have valued your work and have, have encouraged your work, which is really, really cool too. Yeah. It's, you know, that's one of the interesting things about the book is that, I've been blessed to be able to work hand in glove with some of the most accomplished people in the world and what they do. Like Lou Gerstner, Lou Ger- some of your read- listeners may have never heard of him, but he is one of the most successful CEOs of the 20th century. And he ran IBM. He saved it from crushing, you know, collapse. Uh, David Rubenstein, billionaire, uh, Orlando Bravo, billionaire, uh, Adina Friedman. She's CEO of NASDAQ, Glenn Youngkin, He's governor of Virginia. John Kasich, he was governor of Ohio. Mitch Daniels, he was governor of Indiana. And and um, so I, to be able to observe these highly accomplished people and then say, aha, I see what they do in this particular instance, how they, uh, they put logic over emotion, how they pivot from problem to solution, how they economize their time, how they build bridges to pe- with people who don't think like them. And I say, if they could do it, why can't I do it? And so that, so each of the lessons in the book is, it's like a little mini op-ed. They're like seven to 900 words. And they, it's a story. I'm a storyteller. And to, to be able to make a point, and, and, and this is so important, they are accessible. Like if I said, uh, oh, listen, if you can run the Boston Marathon in sub three hours, then you will be your best and you'll be successful. Most people would just like slump over and say, that's not possible. Why should I even try? But that's not even slightly the case. Every lesson in here, like a mortal, a reasonable, like with a reasonable brain and with some discipline and focus and humility is really important, could do literally every one of these things. And I'm so excited that I see young people read the book and say, like, every lesson resonates with them. Then I, David Rubenstein reads the book and says he learned a lot, especially about people he thought he knew well. I got an email from this, some guys easily 62 years old the other day, a former colleague, this lengthy email about lesson by lesson how it impacted him. And he said, oh, my gosh, I should have been doing that for the past 40 years. And... It, 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 it's totally changed my life. I went from the minor leagues to the major leagues. And it's not because I'm a genius. I'm a regular guy from Long Island. It's because I try to be humble and know that I have gifts, but the only way to make them the best for me is to learn from other people. Yeah, and the fact that you just referenced how the most successful individuals, even some referenced in the book, are still learning and going at life, gathering data, gathering situations and learning new solutions and challenges. Like, I think that's something that's that's interesting in itself. There's so many people that stop learning and stop growing. And, you know, it's, it's uh, if you're not growing, you're dying, Lou Holtz used to say. And I think at the end of the day, that's what these, I, I'm always interested as well um, in the number of books that exist out there that are amazing that you may not know are amazing. So one of the benefits of doing a podcast like this is I get to read, go through, study the lives of people that are, as you say, regular guys, regular gals, you know, just they've done, but they've done amazing things. And they're not always PR and communications uh, specialists that that might know the better ways to do things. Some of them just have a great book that if you got in the hands of so many people, but it's never going to be a New York Times bestseller. It's never going to be a Wall Street Journal bestseller, but it doesn't mean it's not an amazing piece of literature or of learning. And I, I love mm-hmm. that about learning from these books. Yeah, I and, and, you, and actually that's it's a good segue to you don't know where a great lesson is going to come from. And as you noted, the title 
is four billionaires and a parking attendant. That's what so I was waiting on. There we go. All right, the parking attendant. So parking attendant is a guy named Sala. He's an Ethiopian immigrant. And so there's the Carlisle building, this beautiful building on Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington. And I'd pull in the driveway and into the garage and Sala would park my car every day for four years. And we got to be friends because he's just so happy. You, you know, it didn't matter how hot it was in the garage in the summer or how cold it was in the winter. And it's always kind of dark in there. Sala was happy. Mr. Chris, how are you? How's your day? How's your family? What do you do this weekend? What are you, what are you excited about? And I was just amazed by that. And I was really inspired by it because it go from hot or cold or, and dark and it get in an elevator and you go up 40 feet into this beautiful modern space that's temperature controlled and is all these billionaires, literally billionaire, billionaire, billionaire. And they're not always very happy. And you say, how is that possible? The guy making $35,000 in the basement is happy. And you know what it is? He chooses to be happy. And I know love is an important theme for you. You know, love is not a feeling, I, I believe. Love is a choice. When you love another human being, you choose to love them despite their faults and, and imperfections. And you know, to choose to be happy means that I'm going to make the most of the gifts that I have, and I'm not going to fixate on the things I don't have. I'm going to seize the day because this day will never happen again. And that's what Sala was like. You know, when, when he became an American citizen, I took my daughters to his naturalization ceremony, and it was a beautiful experience. I, I gave him an American flag as his present. And we're friends to this day. And almost 10 years now that we've, we've known each other. And, and at my first book party, I, I have a photo of the billionaire and the parking attendant holding the book. And it, it's very impactful for me because to choose to be happy is so important. It's more, than, it's more important than making money. I mean, you got to take care of your family and all that, but choosing to make the most of your gifts is so important. And the money will come, I think. Well, I, I, I love the fact that when you are highlighting somebody who's coming at life from a completely different scenario, they, they have come to this country, they're, they're embracing the opportunity, they're coming at each day, giving love, showing affection, being happy, choosing exactly what you said. And I have always thought love is an action. Like I have to do it. Like I have to actually work at it. It's something that requires, like in a good way, you know, it's a, it's a constant moving thing. Like we talked about that momentum, you know, in order to receive love, I have to give love. Right. And mm -hmm. um, it's very hard to go through life, always wanting to receive love and never understanding why you're not getting it. And the reality is you're usually just not giving it. And so to highlight him, so many immigrants come over to this country. So many people in general are the first generation that chart the course. And maybe they're the greatest at their job and their job never earned more than $27,000 a year, but they taught their kids that lesson. They showed the way, they gave their family a different opportunity. And you have no idea whether the parking lot attendant's son or daughter or granddaughter could also be one of those billionaires one day in that same room. And that's, mm -hmm. that's the world that we live in. That's the that it starts somewhere and it starts small. And I, I love the, I, I love the title. I love the way that you put the four billionaires and the parking attendant together. I can't, I, I got to find the picture. Cause I think that sounds like a great picture. And um, I'm going to, I'm going to put it on the screen oh, here great. and see if uh, while we're talking here. Uh, yeah, it, it is. It's very, very, very inspiring. Um, oh, here we go. All right. We'll try to get it. All right, here we go. See if you can. So oh, yeah. Sala is African American. Uh, the billionaire is the the white haired guy uh, on the on the side, and then I'm on the far other side, and then my publisher is there. Uh, and it was great, you know. And Sala was, you know, a little worried about going. You know, he doesn't hang out with billionaires. And I said, Sala, you earned your way into this book. You deserve to be there. It would really be important to me that you're there. And he did. He came and he had a great time. Uh, he met a lot of people, and he his face like was just, it hurt from smiling so much. You know, it was it was really special. That's amazing. 
Chris, I love the way you come at life. I love your story. I've loved learning about you, which is always one of my favorite parts about this podcast. Um, I will definitely grab a cup of coffee or lunch with you in the future because I feel like serendipity, if, if two people that come at the world the way that we both are talking, imagine the people that would be attracted to us in that room that might just <laughs> drop into the into the room. So uh, I love it. I love it. Well, but, I, I, I love your spirit, Scott. And um, I think what you're doing here, uh, focusing on life, a great acronym is so important to inspire people to be their best and to make an impact in the world. Uh, you know, figuring out their why, why, figuring out the why is so important. I gave a lecture on this topic to at a PR firm a week ago, literally. Too often we, f we focus on what. We should be focused on why. So I'm totally with you. And I, I, bet, I bet your listeners just love when you address that subject because it's so important. Yeah, I, I enjoy this. This is a this is not this is not work. It's a hobby for me. I absolutely love these conversations. Um, Chris, how can people get more of you? Where where can they find your stuff? How can they get more of the mentorship uh, or maybe even a whistling birthday message? <laughs> Uh, I have a website. So it's chrisulman.com, C-H-R-I-S-U-L-L-M-A-N.com. Uh, I'm on Twitter, but I don't, I don't use it that much. So it's, but I'm on LinkedIn. If anyone wants to friend me on LinkedIn, uh, you know, the, for, and then uh, the book is on Amazon. And uh, I also have another book about whistling, not how to whistle, but finding your simple gift in life. And that's called Find Your Whistle. That's on Amazon. Also, that, that's from uh, almost eight years ago. So it's been, uh, I, I'd love for people to be in touch. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for joining me, Chris. I'm so grateful to have you. And I look forward to seeing you into the future. And everybody should go out and buy this book. Well, thank you, Scott. I really appreciate it. And uh, best to your listeners. I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you liked it, there's more where this one came from. Click here and enjoy some more.